Good afternoon, class. My name is Gary Walter. I am a nationally registered paramedic. Been working in the field for about 30 years. Today, I want to talk to you about trauma. Uh, I just want to start out with a little bit a story of, that happened when I was in the early days of EMS. There was a call down the road from our uh, from our ambulance station. It was in a large industrial area. The crew arrived. The uh, patient had no pulse, no respirations. They worked on it for 45 minutes on the scene. They pushed drugs, they ran fluids, they um, defibrillated him two or three times. And I remember when we were doing case review a couple of weeks ago, our, our medical director was telling us how 35 minutes on the scene was way too long. And I remember those paramedics, I was a lowly EMT at the time, I remember those paramedics just whining and complaining about how in the world could they ever have a shorter scene time if they're going to do everything that they need to do on scene. Today, we are 30 some years into the future and rapid assessment, rapid packaging, rapid transport are givens, but I do want to talk to you about how we need to be thinking and what our mindset is in relation to that. We have three objectives in this class today. Uh, the first one is uh, we're going to look at three key findings that you will see that will determine whether or not you need uh, rapid assessment, rapid treatment, uh, rapid packaging, and rapid transport. We want to talk about the uh, possibility of delaying our secondary exam. And we are going to, after I get done talking, we're going to practice packaging and doing rapid transport. Um, here we have our patient. We have our, our typical kits. And... Um, let me tell you just a little bit more about this story that, uh, that happened. I remember sitting in this room, a lot of very experienced, very talented paramedics, just pushing back at our medical director, telling him that there was no way they could do faster treatment and transport. And he suggested some ways that they could spike IV bags on the way, they could uh, get some, um, some other equipment ready, they can move the patient to the back of the ambulance and begin to do some treatment back there. And so to sort of appease them, he said, let's do this. The next major trauma patient you have, see if you can do a scene time of 20 to 25 minutes or less. And everybody kind of rolled their eyes and they didn't see it was possible. Well, six months later, we got together for another case review session. And people were like, we did it. We're, we're making it 10, 15, 10, 20, I mean, 20, 25 minutes. We're, we're, we're getting this done. Well, it was about three or four years later when the PHTLS program really hit the country and came out, and they were advocating a 10-minute scene time or less. But by that time, most of us were like, we can do 10 minutes. If, if you have a patient that requires no extrication, there's no safety considerations, we're just ready to go, um, we can do that. Well, I taught a class a couple of days ago with a bunch of new EMT students who do not have a lot of experience in the field. And as I presented these concepts to them, they looked at me and they nodded their head and they seemed to want to do that. But I noticed, as I actually put the scenario before them, they started to get bogged down on the details that are probably overly stressed in EMT classes. So today I want to talk to you about three key things that you need to look for and, and we'll, we'll key you in for rapid, uh, rapid decision making, rapid packaging, and, and rapid treatment. Obviously, you got your ABCs. If you walk up to a patient and they do not have a patent airway, they're not breathing, uh, they have an airway obstruction, maybe they have some sort of major trauma going on or in the face and the neck, that becomes your primary focus. That alone on your trauma patient is going to tell you we need to get in the back of the ambulance. We need to get this person to a surgical center, a trauma surgical center. The second thing that you're going to look for is if they're not breathing adequately. If they're breathing less than 12 times a minute, if they're breathing more than 30 times a minute, they have major blunt force trauma, they have major penetrating trauma, anything along those lines that tell you that you're going to need to assist this patient's uh, ventilations in any way, that should key you in to rapid packaging and rapid transport. The, uh, the other major thing that you need to be looking for 
is uh, the circulation. It's just ABCs. If their circulation is diminished, any kind of hypotension, any kind of shock symptoms, whether from across the room, from across the scene, you look and you can tell they're pale, they're moist, they're, they're cyanotic, they're any, anything other than normal. And you can tell that they are a sick patient. And then as you rapidly uh, give an assessment, you know they have a low uh, blood pressure status, they have a high pulse rate, they're in shock, you need to go. So airway, breathing, circulation, any of those things are amiss. You want to get this patient into the ambulance and get moving towards a trauma surgical center as, as quickly as you can. Now, some parts of the country uh, do not have level one and level two trauma centers available. You may want to be thinking about air transport or other things like that, wilderness considerations um, uh, notwithstanding. But in, in any of these situations, airway, breathing, circulation, if they're miss, we're going to go. So you come up. You, you know as well as I do that a lot of this stuff is done simultaneously. You're not doing it necessarily sequentially. You will come up, they don't have an airway, they, they're, they're not breathing adequately, you're going to immediately start bagging them. You may need oral airways, you need, you may need uh, uh, king airway, intubation, whatever it's going to take to protect that airway and to adequately ventilate them. The airway is patent. If uh, they don't have any major blood or trauma, you don't need the suction, you don't need it, then you can move on to the breathing aspect. If they are breathing inadequately, either through chest injury, head injury, um, uh, maybe, maybe some other forms of lung trauma that, that have messed up their breathing, uh, again, go back to bagging, go back to an advanced airway, and your whole focus may be on that. Those are fine, circulation is down. There's not a lot we can do about circulation in the field. Yes, we can put uh, large bore IVs in, we can transport them, but uh, those need to be done en route. Uh, they're, they're, they're not gonna do, do you any good to stay on scene and handle those. What I found my students doing the other day is they got bogged down on C-spine. The spider straps are a great tool, but they take a long time. You need to delegate that. The, the, the primary care providers need to focus on the airway, breathing, circulation. We need to get them packaged. We need to get them into the back of the ambulance. We should have our skill set down so well that we are doing the rapid packaging. We are getting them immobilized onto a backboard as if it were second nature. So do the airway. Take care of the breathing. Take care of the circulation as, as well as you can. But all of this, I've found you can do all of this in five minutes or less and be in the back of the ambulance and moving. That could even include um, needle thoracotomies. It could, uh, if, if you need even more advanced uh, airway protection, if you need surgical crank or, or something along those lines, if you need to RSI this patient, move them into the back of the ambulance, get into a controlled environment, Take care of those things in the back of the ambulance and even do them moving if you can. When it comes time to actually place the tube into the patient, you can have your partner stop alongside the road, place the tube, and then get moving again. Three key things, three key findings, airway, breathing, circulation. If any of those are amiss, get into the ambulance and get going down the road. Do not focus on the bleeding. My students the other day were telling me, well, you said his leg was bleeding. I, we probably better bandage that. No. Unless there is major blood oozing all over the floor, squirting out from arterial bleeds, you're not going to take care of that. You are going to, in my experience uh, over the last several decades, rarely have I needed to use all those bandaging skills that I, used, that I learned in my ENT class. Ignore that stuff. Exposure. Uh, secondary exam, all that stuff, you may not get past that. If you have a difficult airway to maintain, if you have breathing that you need to assist or take over for the patient, or if you have uh, diminished circulation problems through shock or hypertension. Uh, we are now going to break into our, our groups. We're going to have uh, the blue team over there, we're going to have the red team over there, and the yellow team is going to meet over here. And your, um, your team proctors will be working you through that process.
So we will break into those groups now. Thank you.